Sorry, just ran to my office for something. Um, so histology, remember histology is going to be the study of the tissues. When it comes to the layers in our digestive system, the innermost layer is going to be called the mucosa. The mucosa is going to be obviously covered in mucus. So it makes it easier for things to move and it also provides that kind of protective layer on the inner tube. The submucosa happens right below that. This is where the coiled portion of your glands is going to be. This is where your blood supply to provide the um, inner layer with is going to be. You also have the enteric plexus. Remember how we talked about the sympathetic nervous system and we talked about the parasympathetic nervous system. And we said that in the um, same autonomic nervous system, you had the enteric that control the entire digestive tract, right? So here is the submucosal plexus because it's right next to the submucosa. Here's the myenteric plexus. Myo means muscle, right? So the next layer out is the muscularis. Now in most of your digestive tract, not all, but in most of your digestive tract, you're going to have a circular layer of muscle that does the squeezing. And then you're gonna have a longitudinal layer that actually has fibers going down the long way of the tube. The only exception to that is the stomach because the stomach actually has an oblique layer. Everybody else though just has the two. So you've got that circular layer internally and the longitudinal layer externally. And then finally out here, you've got the serosa. Um, the serosa is the connective tissue that basically helps to hold everything in place. That's why all of these organs that are up here aren't just in a big old in the bottom of your pelvis because they've got this layer that actually surrounds it and then holds it up, okay? So looking at the enteric nervous system, remember the enteric nervous system actually has the same types of neurons as everything else in a reflex arc. You've got sensory neurons, interneurons, and motor neurons. That has not changed, but they are under kind of local control, okay? So you've got this, um, kind of locally controlled um, monitoring system. Something else that you have to understand is with your digestive system, it's not going to be as easy as, um, okay, I just have to put stuff in there. Enzymes are expensive. Enzymes are super expensive. So if you're talking about, um, I ate a steak, right? Then I'm not going to put sugar enzymes into that. I'm not going to put, um, let's say, um, nuclease enzymes into that. I'm going to primarily put protein enzymes. So I have to be able to sense that, think about that, and then respond by saying, okay, you need to put protein enzyme, you need to put protein enzyme. No, 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 no. you don't have to worry about enzyme because you're a sugar enzyme. Don't worry about that right now. So that monitoring, making decisions, and then putting those decisions into action, same reflex arc that we've been talking about since chapter one. Um, the central nervous system can also influence the digestive tract, especially our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. If there is a cougar in the parking lot, I don't really care about digesting the sandwich I had for lunch yesterday. It's not important, okay? So the chemical regulation of our digestive system, there are neurotransmitters that help to control it. And there are over 30 that influence that enteric nervous system, the nervous system that is controlling our digestive tract. Um, it also produces its own hormones that can influence digestion and gland secretion. Two of those are called gastrin and secretin. So you do have those kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Paracrine signals that are, let's say, going from my stomach to, or no, my intestine to my stomach that are basically saying, okay, I need you to stop 
giving me product, just give me a few minutes. There are those types of chemical signals, those neurotransmitters that are kind of influencing how these things are moving. Um, other digestive tract chemicals are local acting hormones that allow for local control of digestion. So one of the kind of interesting things, at least I think it's interesting, chilies pumps out the smell of their food very intentionally because when people smell it, it causes their digestive system to go, oh, I'm so hungry. And you start that with your stomach. That actually happens because your nervous system, your brain sends a signal and says, start moving the stomach because we're going to get food because I can smell it. That's nervous system control. Okay. Okay. All right. So, chem oh, I already said, ugh, sorry. Um, the peritoneum. We've talked about the membranes covering organs and um, the cavities that those organs sit in forever. We've talked about that, gosh, since chapter one. The last few slides of chapter one or the last slide even of chapter one, we talked about the membrane covering the organ called the visceral membrane and then the membrane covering the cavity called the parietal membrane. So we're gonna talk about that specifically in regard to our digestive system. And I just noticed all of the shadows on the screen. Give me a second. Okay, so there's one shadow you're gonna have to deal with. Sorry, I can't move the sink spigot. All right, so the serous membranes. These are membranes that line the body cavity and the organs that are there. With our abdominal organs, we kind of have something relatively unique. When we talked about the heart, we talked about the pericardium, right? The pericardial sac. Most of the organs that we've discussed so far kind of have their own layer of shrink wrap on top of them. When it comes to your digestive system, it's kind of interesting because it's not that way. Something unique about your digestive tract is that the membranes actually wrap around multiple organs. They kind of innervate in between the organs. So they're not just going around the stomach. They go around the stomach, keep going down, wrap around the intestine. So you do have a visceral peritoneum. Remember, visceral always means inside, internal. So the visceral peritoneum is going to be the layer that's covering the organ like shrink wrap. We also have the parietal peritoneum. This is the one that's gonna cover the cavity outside of the organs. Now, the peritoneal cavity is actually filled with fluid that lubricates all of this. So every time you move, whether that's sitting down or standing up or bending over or bending back, all of these organs are rubbing. They're still swishing around in there. Even though they're being held up and all of that, they're still kind of rubbing up against each other. So we have fluid in between that helps to lubricate so that they don't rub themselves raw. There are five major folds in our peritoneum. We've got the greater omentum. The greater omentum is called the fatty apron because if you look at it, it looks like you know one of those little aprons that sits here. Um, this is the largest fold and it basically drapes from the bottom of the stomach here all the way down almost into the pelvis, not quite there, but almost. Okay, if you've got extra fat, a lot of times this is where it's going to get stored. When you go in to have lipo on your stomach, this is what they're basically jabbing with that needle to suck fat out. Um, you also have the falciform ligament and up at the top here, the coronary ligament that holds your liver um, in place. The falciform is gonna hold it to the anterior wall of your abdomen. The coronary is actually holding it up um, to the underside of the diaphragm, okay? The lesser omentum. So here's the liver. And what I've done is I've taken the liver and I've pulled it up like this so you can see underneath it, 
okay? And you can actually see the clamps of that here. See this little piece of tissue here that's basically holding the underside of the stomach or the upper side of the stomach to the underside of the liver. This is the lesser omentum, okay? This is what holds your stomach up underneath your liver. The mesentery, it's kind of this fan-shaped fold and it attaches the small intestine to the posterior wall of the abdomen. So this is actually, let's say this is a small intestine, it's folding around it and it's all the way across and then it attaches back to the posterior of that abdominal cavity to keep everything suspended where it needs to be. You also have blood vessels within that um, enveloped tissue and lymphatic vessels and things like that. Um, the mesocolon, which you can see there are a lot of parts to it here, um, but this is actually binding your large intestine. Remember I said it's that upside down U? This is binding that to the back of your abdominal cavity to keep it in place as well. Now the oral cavity, starting at the beginning. So the landmarks of the oral cavity, the lips are going to be the anterior, the cheeks are going to be the lateral walls, the palate is going to be the top, and the muscular floor forms the bottom, your tongue, okay? So that's your oral cavity, that's the space. You have two major regions to that, the vestibule and the um, oral cavity proper. So vestibule, if you close your teeth and close your lips, that space that exists between the front of your teeth and the back of your lips is going to be the vestibule. Vestibule is um, the entry. When somebody says, oh, come into the vestibule, they're talking about the entry into their house. I don't have one of those. I, I'm not that rich. But if somebody is very, very well off, they normally will have kind of an entry into their house. It's like a small little room. That's what that is. Now, the oral cavity proper. Close your teeth. Where your tongue sits, that space behind your teeth, that's the oral cavity proper. Okay? Okay. Now, the lips themselves, okay, they are formed mostly from muscle and connective tissue. The outer surface, I'm sure you know this, is covered in skin, but it is very thin. One of the reasons that your lips look pink is because that skin is not as thick as the skin here. So the pink color that you see here is actually because you're looking at the blood flowing underneath, okay? Um, as the lips curl inward, so we're going from out here to in here, okay, so out here to in here, it goes from being stratified squamous epithelium, same as your skin, to moist stratified squamous epithelium, okay? Where was I? Okay, so the moisture inside of your mouth, kind of important, right? Everybody's probably had dry mouth at some point, right? You want that moisture in there. The labial frenula, there's a mucosal fold that extends from the alveolar processes to the lips. So let me see if I can. That piece right there that basically allows you to and pull back, there's that piece of tissue and there's one up here as well. These are the pieces of tissue that basically give you anchor points so that you can pull back and pull your lips back to your face. The cheeks, the interior is again that moist stratified squamous epithelium, right? We've got the moist pink part of our lips inside. The exterior is going to be skin. You've got muscles here that help to hold the cheek to the teeth, I can and pull these in, right? Okay. Um, and most of the time, we do have fat pads. You can see this in kids really, really well. I'm sure you can see it in me too, because I got fat pads everywhere. But 
it helps to kind of fill out your face. When somebody is starving, it tends to kind of sink in and it makes them look almost like a skeleton. That's because the fat pads have been used as energy. Um, both of these, your lips and your cheeks, are essential to the process of mastication, so to chewing your food, and the process of speech. Um, they help to manipulate food within the mouth um, and basically hold it in place while the um, teeth are cutting and tearing it. If you think about, you know, let's say a cracker and you're gonna make a mess, so you put your lips over the cracker and then bite further back, that's basically holding it where you want it so that crumbs don't get everywhere. Um, your cheeks, when you're chewing, it pushes food in between your teeth so it doesn't just stay out here like we're chipmunks. Um, and the muscles in the lips also help um, with words and with speech. When I did this, right, even though I'm talking, you can still see that my lips are moving to make the sounds that I'm making. Even though it's not me talking like this, it's still, there's still a, a, a manipulation to make the sounds that I want to make. Okay. So they're involved in speech as well. Um, and then your lips help with facial expression. So, right? Those all in some way, shape, or form involved my lips changing shape or moving around. All right, the palate. So, top of your mouth, this is the palate. You've got the hard palate on the anterior portion. The soft palate kind of happens as you go further back here, okay? So, the anterior portion is going to be where your maxilla and that palate, um, what is it? The plate, the palate plate, the pa palatine bone. There we go. The palatine plate are. The soft palate is actually skeletal muscle and connective tissue way at the back here where you've got the uvula as well. Um, the uvula, actually, when you swallow, it goes up and blocks access up to your nose. This is why most of the time when you're eating and you swallow, things don't go up your nose because the uvula gets in the way. If you're trying to talk and eat at the same time, different story. Because air has to move, you actually move that uvula and then sometimes food goes the wrong direction. Um, the palatine tonsil. Those are those tonsils right there. These are the ones that when somebody is sick and they don't feel well, they'll go, ah, look at my throat, ah. Okay, unless you've had your tonsils removed, then not that, you're actually looking at the throat itself. But when somebody gets tonsillitis, these are the ones that they tend to look at. Okay, so the tongue. The tongue is covered in papillae. You already know that, we've got the bumps, right? Um, it contains special sensory organs called taste buds. Again, you know that because of chapter 15. We've got two types of muscles for our tongues. We've got extrinsic muscles and we've got intrinsic muscles. Extrinsic muscles are the ones that move your tongue side to side and in and out of your mouth. So that, uh, 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 those. Extrinsic, okay? Intrinsic are the ones that change the shape of your tongue. They're the ones most of the time that we are using when we're doing speech or when we're chewing our food because they're the ones that kind of manipulate our tongue shape to give us the, well, maybe not eating your food, but they're the ones that work for um, speech and being able to change the shape of your tongue to accomplish the sounds that you want to accomplish. So, um, <clears throat> oh, and swallowing. I forgot about swallowing. That ability of your tongue to change shape and basically push the food from the front to the back of your throat, that's um, swallowing. Again, mastication for extrinsic. It's moving your tongue side to side to move food in between your teeth. <clears throat> now, the lingual frenulum. Lingua means tongue right? So just like I had that little piece of tissue here, there's a little piece of tissue under your tongue that basically, again, gives you a pulling point so that you can pull your tongue down, 
Okay. <clears throat> it attaches the tongue to the floor of the mouth. The terminal sulcus. The terminal sulcus basically divides the tongue into front and back halves. It's kind of like a landmark. Okay. The lingual tonsil. On the back of your tongue, you also have another tonsil. Um, we talked about this when we were doing um, the lymphatic system, that we had three sets of tonsils. The lingual is right on the back of the tongue. <clears throat> so the teeth, also known as um, sets of teeth, because we've got a baby set and we've got an adult set. Um, this is a fancy way of saying sets of teeth dentitions humans have two we're born with one kind of um well no we're not born with teeth they come in that's why teething happens but we're born with baby teeth which we call deciduous teeth they erupt anywhere from six months to 24 months and they're replaced between the ages of five and eleven with a baby's mouth, it is a small mouth. So with their mouth, we only have 20 total teeth. And we've got the incisors. Those are going to be the flat teeth in the front here. Okay. These help us to cut like you would with just a flat knife. Okay. We've got the canines. The canines are going to be the pointy vampire teeth. Okay. And then we've got the molars. Those are those flat teeth that are in the back that you can see here. These are kind of like a mocajete. They help us to grind, a mortar and pestle. They help us to grind our food. <clears throat> As we get older, we get our permanent teeth. Bigger mouth, more teeth. We have 32 in total. Again, we still have incisors. We still have those flat teeth in the front. We've got canines or cuspids, which are the pointy ones, our vampire teeth. And then we've got the molars, which we actually have more molars than we did when we were little. We've got the first molar, which we get about the age of six or seven. The second, <clears throat> which is 11 to 13. The third, which can come in 17 to 21 years of age. Now, this is the thing with that third set, though. Some people get them, some people don't. They're the wisdom teeth. Some people actually don't have wisdom teeth at all. So, but some people do. And a lot of times, if you've had braces, you get them removed because all of the work of the braces goes out the window when they come in because they shift everything around in the mouth. <clears throat> so... The crown, let's talk parts of the tooth. Let me start there. The crown of the tooth, you've got basically two crowns for a tooth. The clinical crown is basically the part of your tooth that is exposed to your oral cavity. So anything that's exposed to the oral cavity. The anatomical crown is the part of the tooth covered by enamel. Part of this enamel goes past the gum here. Okay, so that includes that part of the tooth. Okay, now the cusps are the bumps that are going to be on the tooth. The neck is that part that is right um, where the gums are. The root is the part that actually goes down into the bones of the mandible and the maxilla. Dead center in the middle of your tooth, you've got the pulp cavity. Okay, this is the hole, <clears throat> excuse me, in the center of your tooth where all of the pulp is. So you're probably saying, okay, so what's the pulp? The pulp is these blood vessels and these nerves, and there's connective tissue in this space as well. Now, I'm sure everybody has heard of a root canal, but we're talking about something different. The root canal is actually going to be this literal canal where the blood vessels are either coming in or going out and the nerves are coming in or going out. <clears throat> the apical foramen. So foramen means hole, right? So these are the um, sockets that that tooth fits into. So the tooth goes down into these apical holes or apical foramen. Around... <clears throat> the pulp, you've got this stuff here, this kind of orangey looking stuff. This is the dentin. Dentin is living cellular calcified tissue and it surrounds the pulp. 
enamel is not living. It, it doesn't have cells in it at all, but the dentin does. The enamel up here is extremely hard. It's non-living acellular substance that surrounds the tooth. So something to keep in mind with enamel, it is harder than your bone. Okay. So, um, enamel is, is really cool. The only problem is that when it's damaged, when it's cracked, then it becomes fairly brittle. Okay. Below that, so here's my enamel cover. This part that's actually going into the um, the socket that the tooth fits into, okay? Did I go through apical foramen? Yeah, I did, the hole, right? <sighs> Sorry. Okay. So enamel's on top. This that covers the root is actually the cementum. It is a bone-like substance um, within the root that basically is used as an anchor point for these ligaments here, the periodontal ligaments that secure your teeth in your jaw, either your upper jaw or your lower jaw. Um, the alveoli are the sockets themselves. Um, the gingiva, that's a very fancy way of saying gums. So it's dense fibrous connective tissue and stratified squamous epithelial that cover alveolar processes. It's the gums, okay? And then like I said, the periodontal ligaments are gonna be the ligaments that actually hold and anchor your tooth in place, 